Are you ready to be thoroughly inspired by Joe Lance Cicero? Because that is what we're gonna be doing today. and welcome back to that Disney girl. If you're new to the channel, what's up? My name is Alessa and you are here for the third episode of How to Become an Imagineer. And today we are talking with Joe Lancicero who has been Imagineering with the Walt Disney Company for so many years. He has had his hand in so many parks, Disneyland, Disney World, um, from Hong Kong Disneyland, Tokyo Disney Sea. He has done so much. He's created so many iconic attractions, things that we're gonna touch on today, things that we don't even get to touch on today, like the Disney Cruise Lines. I'd love to speak with him again, but I think that this chat is gonna be very special, as you're gonna see. Um, Joe was able to put all of the questions that I had through this lens of how to become an Imagineer. So he's not just typically answering the questions that um, I'm sure he's been asked millions of times, but he's able to answer them in such a way that he is looking at it through a lens of an Imagineer. So there's a lot more of a practical um, answer in all of his questions and a reasoning behind why things have to be the way they are and why that creates a successful ride or attraction or land. So if you are someone who would love to know the kind of inner workings of an Imagineer's mind, this is gonna be a great chat for you. I hope you enjoy and uh, let's get to it. Well, thank you for being on the show today. I'm very excited to be chatting with you. Um, and I have, I mean, you've seen my, my they're not even questions, they're just like my mind rip. Same, same sheet, <laughs> rambling on. Um, and I guess we'll just kind of work through it and uh, I may pick your brain on things if it really jumps out yeah. to me. Um, so uh, as uh, many people know, you started off with animation and the thing that I was curious about was to know how, um, I guess just animation as a whole and creating storyboards, if you think that helped the way um, you like approached creating a new ride or a land. Um, and then after I wanted to touch on, uh, like I know uh, Tony Baxter loved using you for your gags, which from what I've done from research from like, I feel like animation from the beginning of time was like gags just even in the studio to each other and everything like that. So how did that um, influence like uh -huh. theme park design for you and like what was your contribution in that sort of realm? The connection between animation and, um, and theme park design um, and a lot of things is uh, communication. It's all, ultimately you're communicating an idea and ultimately you want to communicate it in a very entertaining way. You know, so we learned, and um, I think the thing with animation, the, the art form is at least back when I was doing it, and I think to, uh, to a lesser or greater degree still the, the same, um, there's an economy to storytelling. Um, you have to really be able to focus in and understand what's the key idea that you're trying to communicate. In animation, it's 24 frames a second. So when you're animating a scene, and I started out first as an animator, an actual animator. Um, actually, you started out as an in-between and you kind of work your way up. But I mean, there, it's like in any craft, you know, there's apprenticeship, you know, and you've got to work your way up. And I think that's what's great about the training that I got there. And Actually, one of the things I'll be talking about through the course of our conversation today, or I'll, I'll be trying to hit on, is um, this idea of, of craft, you know, and learning your craft and um, applying that craft to whatever you're doing. So, um, and, and it's always a combination of craft and art. You know, craft is the, the physical thing that you do, whether it's drawing or painting or sculpting or writing or producing, that's your craft. Then the art and the creativity is, you know, what's happening up here and how you take those great ideas and then use your craft to make them amazing. So animation is a very, it's a very um, disciplined endeavor. You know, it takes, like I said, 24 frames a second. And you have, really have to think about, you know, what am I trying to say here? What is the emotion? What am I trying to get across to the guests. How is this going to engage them? How is this going to draw them in? How is this going to touch them on some emotional level? So it's that same thinking, whether it's an animation scene or whether I'm thinking about a ride or whether I'm thinking about a restaurant in, in a cruise ship, 
is I, I, it's applying that same kind of thinking about, you know, what am I trying to communicate? How am I going to try to communicate it? How am I going to use my craft to best communicate it? And how is it going to ultimately, you know, touch people, engage them and entertain them? Because that in the end is the most important thing. They're putting their hard earned cash down because they want to be entertained. And that's our job as Imagineers, animators, uh, whatever. We are here to entertain the masses. And it makes sense, I feel like, because even at the beginning, like um, with uh, like Walt kind of recruiting Imagineers, a lot of them started off as animators. And I guess it's like that it's because they have this creative mind and they know how to tell the story. So I feel like it, it creates a good like passageway between the two jobs, like from like animation, something on screen to like being some in, in the real life of a land or anything like that. And you just said a key word telling the story because for disney you know everything starts with a story it's all about you know what is the story and um how to communicate that story and we apply story that was the other thing i think i've learned i got a, a good understanding and learning about you know disney storytelling again i was very very fortunate i got to learn from i never met walt but i got to work with all the gentlemen that worked directly with walt so our, our generation of animators, Imagineers were very fortunate because we were the, the ones that got the direct hand down from all those guys. And, um, and that was one of, the big, one of the big lessons was storytelling and how do you apply storytelling across different, different mediums, whether it's animation. And then, then, and then for me, it was when I got to Imagineering, you know, every project is so different. I mean, and, and there's never, even when you were quote, you know, going to lift or duplicate an attraction, like I did the second Splash Mountain in, in Tokyo, or we, we did Toontown a couple times, we did it in California, and then we did it in, in Tokyo. And, and just, you know, even when you're quote, duplicating an attraction, you're still having to rethink a lot of the, the basic elements about it and how it's going to work in a new new location. But my, my big point is um, no, no two projects are ever alike. And so you always have to think about, you know, what are those, th first off, what are those things that make a difference, but then always, always deferring back to what is the core idea? What is the core storytelling piece here that I want to communicate? And then, and then you got to stay true to that. And that's the hardest thing, especially it's, it's, it's such a, an involved discipline. Imagineering, you know, it takes hundreds, you know, maybe sometimes thousands of people to do one of these projects, you know, of all varying de degrees of involvement, you know, from early on, just the small team, maybe that's coming up with the idea all the way to when you get to the field and you've got, you know, hundreds of construction people working and painters and craftsmen and all that. Um, you know, the, the thread through all of that is consistency, making sure what you're doing, you know, is going to be true to that first little idea that you came up with. You know, it's the land where Mickey Mouse lives. It's uh, Lord Henry Mystic and this crazy little monkey getting loose in a mansion. You know, just always staying true to that. Um, and in the end, you know, if you can stand back and after all the, the, the dust clears and the scaffold is down and, you know, they've polished the whole thing up. And if it still holds true to that, that, that original idea, then you can pat yourself on the back and say you did a good job. <laughs> um, and in regards to just, I guess, the, the, the whole gag situation, um, can you just like, I guess, explain to everybody how your gags were used. Sure. Um, well, first, for people that know what gags are, it, you know, it's that, that usually both in, in animation and in, and in Imagineering, um, they're visual mediums. Mm -hmm. You know, we use words, but you see things first and you hear them second. And um, what made the training in animation um, valuable is you have to learn to communicate a gag, you know, to in a visual manner. Um, and of course, the absolute master was Mark Davis. And I put Mark, there's a big pedestal, and I put Mark on top and I bow to him, oh, Mark, you're great. Because um, nobody knew better how to pose a character. And the posing is how you, you know, the, the attitude you have, you know, if they're sad or if they're happy. Um, but then 
then putting it in the right setting. And he often worked with um, Claude Coates, who was great about creating the scenes that Mark put his characters into. And then together it communicated. But you really had to um, understand, you know, visually how to communicate a gag. And so um, I had that training. One of the, my first opportunities when I got over to Imagineering, um, there were a few projects going on at the time. It was kind of at the beginning of the Disney decade. Uh, Euro Disney was coming out of the ground. Um, and I got to thank Tony Baxter because Tony saw that quality in me as well as Marty Scalar. I, I thank them both for, for seeing that I, I had that that again, not comparing myself to Mark Davis, but I did have the same kind of thinking that Mark had in terms of being able to look at a situation and figure out how to put a character or how to, I mean, even simple things. One of the, one of the early projects I worked on was Typhoon Lagoon. And they asked me just to go through the park and come up with funny little visual gags. Cause you know, the whole idea in Typhoon Lagoon was that this typhoon came through and brought all this crazy flotsam and jetsam through and the buildings are topsy turvy and all. So uh, yeah, I just went through and I did, you know, hundreds of little gags of things that could happen when the wind blew strange things and this, uh, the, the crazy juxtaposition of one thing against another. Um, Tony had me go through some of the project, some of the, the uh, attractions and Euro Disneyland. Um, they were trying to do a whole new take on the Haunted Mansion because it was set in Frontierland in Paris, so it had an Old West theme to it. So I came up with a bunch of gags that kind of worked on that. Um, so it was great. It was great to be able to apply that kind of thinking. Same same skills again. Like I said earlier, you know, you're still using your craft of understanding how to stage things, but just applying it now in a new way to the theme park. Yes, and I mean, I feel like one of the the times that I feel like you would have used that idea of like really immersive storytelling of course would be in like mystic point and mystic manner because i feel like you got the rare opportunity to work on a ride that was not based on an ip which for me i love attractions that are not based on um intellectual property uh just because i love like seeing a, another character be created and how many layers goes into that new character and and all of that that stuff just really excites me um so what was it like for you to to kind of work on a mystic manner in terms of starting from scratch and how did you even start to create this character of Henry Mystic and the monkey and how like how much time do you really have to focus on creating that character to make it feel like you're almost like literally it it seems like you're almost in a movie which is easy to attain when you have an uh, like a ride or something that's based on an IP I guess because it's already in your mind but you have to do it from like the moment you see the building walking through and by the time you get on right. the ride have an association and how how do you even begin to come up with that and what's the process <laughs> first off you hit you hit on all the right points all the things that you're trying to do you know what and what ip gives you are known characters characters that you know people have seen the movie or read like harry potter they've read the books they've seen the movies you know, for uh, Star Wars, they've seen the mo the the movies. You know, and so they come. Your your guests come kind of pre wired. They've um, they know who those characters are. And the most important thing that that does, the movies and the IP does, is immediately builds an emotional connection. And that's for me the most important thing. People have got to feel something when. If to, to be successful attraction, if they if they laughed, if they they were scared, whatever, you know, if you touched their emotion in some way, it, you were successful. And that's what IP does a lot of the heavy lifting for you in that regard. Um, so when you when we were creating Mystic Point and Mystic Manor, um, a few things. Uh, first, we we had this backstory, and and there's two ways to to think about story in, in the theme park. Um, you can think about story as narrative, and that's what having a given IP already has built in. It has a known narrative. You know the characters, you've seen the stories, it has a beginning, middle, and end. And then your job when, when applying a known IP to an attraction is to find out what are those trigger points? What are those things like, you know, um, I worked on the Winnie the Pooh rides, the, the one in Tokyo, and uh, the one in Hong Kong, you know, and, and, you know, 
well, I want to see, I want to see Winnie the Pooh. I want to see him get caught in honey. I want to see Heffalumps and Woozles. I want to see Tigger, you know, bouncing around. I want to hear the music. I mean, there's things that, you know, it's almost an expectation. If you, if you say, you know, Winnie the Pooh, if you say Star Wars, you know, people are going to expect to see certain things. So your job is to, to really hone in, find out what those trigger points are and make sure they become part of the narrative of the ride. So that's storytelling as narrative. But then there's storytelling as subtext where you, like in the case of Mystic Point, actually Mystic Point and Mystic Manor was both. It was both story as narrative and story as subtext. First, we had to create the story. A subtext story is a story that runs underneath uh, or, or kind of creates a foundation that you build ideas off of. And then you refer back to that, that story when you're making design choices along the way. Um, so we had already established the story of this, the, the Society of Adventurers and Explorers. Um, actually, I, no, I did, and that was, it was the team that did the original Tokyo Disney Sea. Um, and so when we did Tower of Terror in Tokyo, uh, we built on that story. Harrison Hightower, the, the, he was, he's kind of the evil version of Lord Henry Mystic, but he is a member of the society. So we had all this backstory to begin with that we just started building on. And then we thought about it, Mystic Manor, the same way you would think about, you know, doing a movie. You gotta first, you know, come up, come up with the basic story idea, you know, explore, finding music box, meets this little monkey, music box has this curse, don't open the box, monkey opens the box, all craziness breaks loose, has to redeem himself, happy ending. You know, pretty, pretty simple story idea. But, um, and like I said, with a known IP, all the heavy lifting is done for you. People know all that. So our job then was, okay, how do we set all this up and start letting people know, first off, who's Henry, who's um, Lord Henry Mystic, you know, who's Albert the monkey. So we did a series of little vignettes, uh, of like, you know, like a travelogue of photographs and artifacts through the pre-show. Um, that let's start letting you know who the who these characters are and then we actually had a um a or we have a pre-show where we stop everybody put them in a room and they get to meet get to physically meet uh the the albert the monkey they get to learn about the box so they they're by the time they get on the ride vehicle hopefully they have that same amount of information that an ip would give you They've met the monkey. They've met Henry Mystic. They've seen, um, they've seen all the artifacts. They know what the monkey's motivation is, what he's doing. They know a little bit about what Lord Henry's motivation is. And hopefully, and we purposely did that little, that first little scene when the monkey pops up. You know, I said we got. He's got to be as cute as possible. He's got to absolutely steal their heart in a second. Um, and. And then immediately you have empathy for him. And once, and once people have empathy, you know, and feel for that character, then whatever they go through, because you, we knew we were going to put him through hell. You know, he was going to get, you know, he's going to get darts thrown at him and he was going to, you know, going to have the, the magic dust, you know, almost electrocute him, all these things. So you, if you had to feel for the little guy in a way, then he also became the surrogate, our surrogate, you know, we couldn't physically do those things to the guests, but because we had empathy and we felt for the monkey and the monkey had human attributes, then whatever he was going through, we were feeling. So um, getting back to your, the, your initial question was about the, 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 the storytelling, how we came up to it, again, very much the same way or the same way you would for developing a movie, developing an animated feature, or developing a book. Start with story, start with characters, understand where you're going with the story, understand how those, those characters, the arc of their journey through that story, and then know like you do with IP, you know, what are those, what are those trigger points? What are those things that are gonna best communicate that story along the way? And I feel like just, I don't know how I never clocked it earlier, this idea of like just feeling empathy and just, or connecting to the character, which is what we do when we see a movie. And that's, I guess, why you become drawn to it. Why I never thought that, of course, you would be doing that in a, <laughs> in an attraction if you want to make people um, feel the same way. But no, it's, it's very interesting. So I always thought of story of like being entrapped by just a very interesting story. But 
Um, it seems like the layers of the character could possibly almost be even more important like for the individual guest experience. But um, that's very and interesting, and, uh, yeah. And sometimes there's this delicate balance you have. When we were doing the, um, the Monsters Ride and Go Seek in Tokyo, that was, a, that was, we were trying to find the balance because those characters are so, so beloved. Little Boo, especially. She's so cute. And we had a lot of discussions, especially with our, our client or in a land company about, um, because ultimately it's, it's a game attraction. You have the flashlight and you're searching for the little hard hats. Initially, that, the, the game aspect of it wasn't as prominent as the story aspect of it because they were concerned that that would take away from the, um, your appreciation of the characters. Um, and so, and actually in the end, we learned a lesson about, you know, if, if, uh, if, you're, telling, uh, if you're telling your guests it's a game experience, there's expectations about the game experience. You know, um, they have a device, that device they want to either score, they want to know what, how they're engaged in this whole gaming Thing. So it was finding this balance between the amount of gaming and the amount of storytelling that and the, the amount of gaming that wouldn't take away from your appreciation of the characters. Now, the good news is Pixar films are so great at creating empathy for the characters, especially, you know, Pete Doctor's films are amazing. I love Inside Out. I love, love um, looks like his new film, Cool, is going to be amazing, too. But um, you know, they, they really understand, you know, the power of characters and creating these characters that you so understand, you so relate to. So the good news was with Monsters, Inc., um, those characters were, you know, the relationship between Boo and Sully, you know, there was, it was just so rich. So <clears throat> in the end, that was able to bubble up through the, the, the gaming piece of it. And even though people were, were fi not fixated, but you know, were very involved with their, their flashlights, it didn't, in the end, the characters and the character situations were so strong that I think we found the right balance. <laughs> For sure, and it's, it's interesting because, I, I mean, of course, when people think of like Disney or animated things, they're just like, oh, it's children based, but it's the way that you create those characters. And especially, you mentioned Inside Out, and I remember when I saw it with my friends, the first thing I said was this has so many like layers for an adult that a child would never pick up on, but for mm -hmm. an adult watching the movie or um, like no matter what your age range is, there's something in there that pertains to you specifically, um, which uh, I feel like I'm starting to see even more of or I'm picking up of, on more of now. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see how that can be translated so easily into a ride as well on what details um, just any age group will pick up on and how that makes the ride experience better for them. But for the, for, in a mystic manner, if, I mean, I read that there's about 7,000 artifacts scattered throughout that, that bad boy. Um, do, did, is every artifact like meant to be there or some just like, oh, I had a creative idea, like this would look cool or did some have more of a significance to you? How do you kind of do that when you're almost creating this museum? Like, it is kind of like his house is a museum. Um, and how, how do you go about that in terms of, is it very research-based or more creative or um, an amalgamation of the two? <laughs> it's, it is, it's everything supports the story. So the, uh, the big story was that he traveled the world and built this collection. And we set up early in the queue line that he has, a, um, in fact, there's a kind of a map in the queue that shows his, his, the manor, the inside of his manor, and that he, he was very he was very methodical about organizing his collection and and he had the music room so we had and we had you know a whole variety of musical instruments and then he had the um it was kind of like a i don't want to say a dungeon but the the room with the weapons and then he had the egyptian room so um all the artifacts were there to support the story and then and then also we, we thought about, we had this board and we like you, you storyboard, you know, we, we talked about, okay, now if there was a room full of musical instruments, musical instruments are kind of benign. If a musical, because the whole story, as you know, is about this magic music dust bringing things to life. So if a musical instrument comes to life, all it's going to do is entertain you. So we put that early in the ride because we wanted to get this build. But of course, some things like weapons, if they come to life, 
that's going to be a little different. That's going to be a little more dangerous. So of course we put that later into the ride. Um, but each of the, all these artifacts were there to support the story idea. Um, and it was fun, you know, coming up with, and a lot of them um, were actually physically built. We actually, you know, took research. Um, one of the gentlemen that worked on the, the project early on was just like so deep into research and kind of laid the foundation for um, us to work off of in terms of, you know, all the different kinds of, of things that, um, that we could use for the, the various rooms. Um, so for the most part, everything is very historically and physically accurate. It's, the, it's based on something real that's out in the world. Some things, like I said, we bought, other things we, we replicated. I mean, it, may, it totally makes sense, but I like that how, even though it's there to support the story, it still has like a concrete foundation on just like each individual item, which uh, I, I'm, I also am someone who just loves research and what goes into that sort of thing. So it gets me excited. And the other thing is um, it adds authenticity and believability. Yeah. You know, those were two things we learned a lot about in, in uh, animation. And the things that make um, Disney storytelling, um, again, there's a, I, John Lasseter always talked about how in Pixar films, they created rules for the universe. You know, there are if whatever universe they were creating for the films, you have to have rules that govern that, that universe because then it gives it, it gives it authenticity and becomes believable. You know, um, if everything is, oh, it's all magical and anything can happen, um, then it, it, it can go anywhere. But if you create, you know, if you create a framework where you say, you know, in this world, you know, characters can only do this and this, they're going to react this way to things. And it sets up parameters that in some ways, you know, people go, oh, that's limiting, you're building boxes. But it's important to have that, that box because the, then the audience knows what, what to expect a little bit. You know, um, if a character has like limited capabilities, you know, he's not very smart then when he gets into a situation, you, and if you're true to that, you know, you're, you're gonna kind of expect him, oh no, there's that giant monster is ready to eat him. If he doesn't do this, and, and because of who he is, then he gets eaten because he wasn't thinking or whatever. But the, those rules of the universe and understanding how to, you know, how to make the audience understand those becomes really, really important to, um, to, to this, these 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 storytelling uh, storytelling whether it's animation or a, a, a ride. I feel like I'm I'm seeing things in different lights right now, so it's very cool. Uh, and before I jump away from this, is me just being selfish because, like like I said, I really like the Disney Sea. Um, but in inside of the queue for uh, Mystic Manor. Um, I know there's lots of it's to me it's probably one of the attractions that ties in so many of these different characters that are across all of the Disney parks and was that uh, like an afterthought or a choice that was like a like a fun idea to kind of place those things in there where I, I don't know if you were directly involved with that that kind of point that yeah okay <laughs> that makes me yeah. happy <laughs> Well, it goes back to what I said earlier about, you know, this, this bigger story idea of the Disney, uh, the, the, the Society of, Explor of Adventurers and Explorers, SEA. Um, and this gets back to what I was just saying about creating, creating a universe that builds believability, you know, that there, we made, we, we created history, you know when you know something is connected to history, it makes it more believable and makes it more authentic. So we created our own history. We created these, this society and we created that, you know, again, this gets back that whole idea of subtext, you know, that we, there's all this story that the audience may not, may not um, directly be exposed to, but it's all there and it's all there to make things feel more authentic and to make things feel more real. So all that backstory that you were, all those characters that we came up with, you know, I, I, I put myself in there and <laughs> as one of the, as one of the members of SEA, uh, um, but, and that's all fun, but, but underneath it all, it's, it's very, it's, it's about, you know, understanding and creating, you know, very serious backstory 
that makes the whole experience seem more real and more believable. And even we even included um, you know, Danny Elfman, the famous music composer. Oh yes, because he you got to work with him, which is amazing. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> oh my god, that was so great. Uh, and of course, Danny ended up becoming a member of SEA too, because he's there in the in the pre shows as one of the members of the society society as well. Um, but again, I, on the surface, it's all fun. But I, like I said, underneath it, it's, it's, it has a purpose, it has a very real purpose for being there. Yeah, well, I think it's the reason that all of these like attractions that aren't based on IPs are successful. It's because they have, I mean, and, and especially if you're someone like me who wants to go to dig deeper and see how they're all connected, it becomes something even more amazing because it's one an attraction that is based on an IP. It's not really connected to anything else in the park exactly just because it lives in its own story but you guys are able to create individual stories that are in a universe which um i, I was call, i was calling it like the disney fictionalized character cinematic universe that is oh, there <laughs> um, well, uh, i'll jump to tokyo disney sea which i i've i've never been but it looks stunning I, it's reasonable to say that people would agree it is the most beautiful disney park that exists um and i'm just wondering why 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 is this one so um like great did you did you feel it was because of uh did you have more creative abilities um is it because it wasn't maybe directly connected um with disney because there's another company in there with you um just was it from conception that that's that was kind of the idea w was this idea of beauty in the forefront of anyone's mind or did it just happen and I'm ranting, but I feel like you kind of understand where I'm coming from. Well, the reality, <laughs> no, nothing just happens. And it's all, every, everything is considered. Um, I think with Tokyo Disney Sea, uh, it's a good example of, you know, if you have the right direction and you have the right um, motivation, um, it can push you to create, to make something really, really great. And fortunately, uh, Orion Land Company, who owns and operates those parks, um, they had a pretty grand vision for this park. Um, and the original designers, um, Tim Kirk, uh, actually his, his, his brother Steve Kirk was in charge of the design. Um, these are really, really smart and talented guys and they rose to the occasion. Uh, they were challenged by Orion Land Company to create something magnificent and they did. Um, I always find it interesting that at that same moment in history, Disney's California Adventure was being designed by, by Imagineering, same, same group that was designing Tokyo Disney Sea, but the two were very, the outcomes. Oh yeah, the, the success yeah. levels, I mean, at the beginning yeah. at least, not the same. And, 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 and I, I say this because it in no way is reflected on the Imagineers. I mean, Imagineers always want to do, create greatness. Of course. Yeah. You know? um, but often, you know, they, they don't have the resources available to them in terms of money. They don't have the, the right motivators there. You know? And people with vision and passion, it takes vision and passion to have greatness in the end. Um, and, and appreciating that vision and that, that passion, you know, having leaders that see that and embrace it and encourage it is so important. Um, and I think a lot of the projects they they are successful or they are less successful or in some cases even failures because the the top leadership didn't appreciate the vision and passion of the people that were trying to make greatness um and i think that and that was the case with tokyo disney sea and i was fortunate to be able to i worked on it originally you know at the conceptual level and then I actually went away for a while and then as fate would have it, I inherited the park again and was the creative executive over the park um, during its formative years after it right, right after it opened. And you know, the thing with these, these theme parks, um, you, do, you don't always get it right the first time. Um, and what's great is that you can go back and you can play with it. I think that was the thing, even Walt Disney talked about this, about um, 
about the original Disneyland, why he loved the whole idea of Disneyland. He said, you know, when, when he made a movie, when the movie was done, it was in the can, that was it. You put it on the shelf, it was over. He said, but, but he saw Disneyland as this living, breathing organism that was always going to change. It was always going to evolve. He talked about how yeah, even the, the, the flowers were going to grow, the trees were going get, to get bigger. Um, I mean, it's expensive to go back into these parks and, you know, enhance them or fix them. In the case of DCA, you know, again, the right leaders with the right vision came in later on and they committed to making DCA great. And it is great now. I mean, they've got some of the best attractions in the world there. Cars Land is absolutely amazing. So, um, you know, it, it, it takes that, that visionary thinking and to, to push them in and make it great. The carousel that um, you've noted as like that's like kind of the weenie of that land. Was that always like your intention to have it as a carousel? Could it have been something else? And I guess in, in, in individual lands, I've never thought of like how they all definitely do have to still have like that focal point that draws you into them. Because usually you think of like a park as a whole has something that's like the center of it, but then there's all of these other little ones and um, I guess how did how did you kind of come up with that and why was it important to have that and when you're starting with a park from the ground up and I was like I said I was part of the initial team working with Steve Kirk and and all the other people that brilliant people that he surrounded himself with on uh, on the design team the concept team that work on the initial park um, also a very important component are the park operators um, and there was always debate about how early on in the process do you bring the, the people that are going to ultimately operate the park? In the case of Tokyo Disney Sea, um, they, they involved both the operators from Orion Land Company and some key operators from Disneyland early on, from, from uh, Disney uh, Parks and Resorts operations. Um, and what they did is help um, figure out the menu early on of, you know, what is the menu of attractions you're going to have on opening day? And, and, and often that's, it's, it's, it's divorced of storytelling. It's just, okay, we need a, we need X amount of thrill attractions. We need a coaster like experience. We need uh, X amount of kiddie kind of rides. Uh, and then they talk about, you know, the, uh, the, the food program and how many restaurants, how many sit down restaurants, how many uh, walk up windows, how many carts are you going to need entertainment program, you know, are we going to build in a big nighttime show. So, you know, working early on is just, you know, forming all the big ideas all that are going to make the, the overall experience because you want to create a very satisfying experience for the guests. And you really only get that opportunity um, to really think about the small things and the big things when you're initially planning a park, because it's awfully hard later on to go back into a park after it's open and add little things back in. Because once the park is open, it, then it becomes about marketing the park. And marketing means having some big, either new show or big new, you know, e-ticket attraction that's going to draw people into parks. So making sure you get that nice balance of attractions early on becomes important. So taking this all the way back to the, the carousel, <laughs> we knew as part of the park, park menu, we wanted you know, to have you know, a carousel somewhere in the park. And at first blush, it, did it make sense in, in Arabian Coast? And Arabian Coast was conceived um, at the time the Aladdin film came out, they wanted to make a nod to Aladdin, but they didn't want it to be a cartoon Aladdin world, like, uh, uh, like Mermaid Lagoon, which is absolutely a nod to Little Mermaid, all the characters from Little Mermaid, the look from the film, you know, we really wanted to bring you into that world. But um, Arabian Coast had, they wanted to have a little more real world, like the rest of Tokyo Disney Sea, and it gets back to this, this no, the idea of, you know, creating a believable place, you know, if, if there are real world touchstones, if you've, you know, either read in a book, seen in a movie or actually had the opportunity to travel to that part of the world and saw the architecture, saw the way people interacted with the architecture, then you want to bring some of that 
that authenticity to it. But then remember, getting back to what I said earlier, early on too, about everything has to be entertaining, you know, because people put down their hard earned dollars and they want to be entertained. So then that's where you bring the, maybe some of the fantasy aspect into it and try to find that, that balance of the real and the fantasy so that it becomes very, it's very satisfying and create and creates that emotional connection to things. Um, so the carousel, all this, <laughs> getting back to the carousel, you know, has the, has the Aladdin characters on it, but it's, it's housed in a very authentic looking piece of architecture from that part of the world and that, that place. And then the way we, we, we placed it in this, the courtyard. What's interesting about that land is that it has two, like many of the lands in Tokyo Disney Sea, you can, um, you can access them from uh, two different directions. So we really thought about how, how that played staging wise, depending on where you entered from either side. The other thing that Tokyo Disney Sea did, did a great job was playing with elevation, which is always really nice because um, it gives you an opportunity to, you know, to stage things so you can, you can first see, you can enter at a higher elevation and kind of get a, a broad view of what you're going to, what you're going to be later exploring or either coming in at a lower elevation and kind of getting a different perspective on things. It just makes for a more interesting uh, involvement with the environment when you play with the, the elevations and that park does a really good job of that. Um, it's funny because as you were talking about um, j just that whole, that whole section of the park being um, like you, n not too animated or anything like that and still having like a base in reality, to me, like the live action version of Aladdin has very similar. I mean, it's a co they use like a coastal right. sort of city there. So and that yeah, comes exactly. much later. So it's almost like that would have been what the like the fantastic, <laughs> the fantasy or fan fan fantastical. Uh, that's a word um, <laughs> like a fantasy mixed with reality. So I feel like definitely got it right there. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, that's just I don't know. I was thinking about that um, and I, I, I wanted to quickly touch, uh, I will touch on Mermaid Lagoon really quickly. Something that we mentioned the question right before when we we're talking about thing, like how Disney as a whole um, is always ever changing. I mean, we heard it j just the other day, where Splash Mountain's being reworked, just things that are constantly changing. You were working on Simbad a little bit at the beginning, but you kind of went in and reworked it. And I was just wondering, what is it like to rework an attraction especially one that like maybe people have grown to love or um, just this idea of, of kind of coming in and spinning it on its head. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, I said a moment ago, you know, you don't always get it right first time out. Um, and it's hard because, um, you know, there's so, ma there's so many elements, there's so many moving parts in designing these, these attractions. Um, and you make, you make assumptions and nobody, nobody sets out to do a bad job, especially at Imagineering. Everybody wants to do something great. But some, sometimes you, you miss the mark. Um, with Sinbad, I had worked on the original idea. Um, and it was just more about, when I was working on it, we were talking more just about the, the story arc, you know, the adventures of, you know, because the source material Sinbad it, it, you know, he, he goes through all these various adventures and it was, it was kind of like with a movie, you know, like I said earlier, where you, you know that there are certain expectations of things that people are going to want to see. And so you want, you're going to make sure those scenes are in there. So that's where I was involved early on. But then there were some choices made about how to present it stylistically. And I think um, it was, a, it was initially a, an interesting notion um, on the part of the, the people that then took it and, and were, were, taking it to the to the next level of design of this idea of well let's do kind of a it's kind of like small world you know in terms of doing cute cute size characters um not humanoid characters like pirates but they also like the swashbuckling nature of pirates and wanted kind of that tone in the the ride so they were always talked about this you know the walking this fine line between small world and pirates but in the end, I think you let big, my big lesson, you know, and I had the, the benefit of hindsight. It's very easy, you know, after the fact to look at something with 2020 vision and say, well, you know, maybe that wasn't the right decision to do. It was to them it was the right decision at the time when they made it. So um, when we went back and looked at it a second time, we had to make a decision. Is it going to be 
what are we going to focus on? The swashbuckling aspects of Sinbad and those stories, which in the stories are very swashbuckling, or the cute aspect of it? Well, because the Japanese love cute, <laughs> and we also knew that, um, again, we needed to build empathy. So we did, we did a couple things. We made two big choices. The first one was to really focus on the cute aspect of it. Make sure that Sinbad became a very friendly, engaging, and empathetic character. But then we said we really need a device to really create empathy. And just like the monkey in Mystic Point and Mystic Manor, Albert the monkey, we created the little tiger character to be Sinbad's sidekick. And immediately, you know, everybody has, or anybody that has a pet, whether it's a dog or a cat, you understand that empathy that you have, that relationship between you and that little, that little furry friend that lives with you every day. Um, so just by, just by creating that little tiger, we immediately gave people something that they understood and had a great deal of empathy and emotional connection. And then we just had fun with this, this little tiger. We made, you know, we thought about he's going to be playful, you know, he's going to be a little mischievous. And so as you go through the attraction, you know, Sinbad is, is watching him get into a little, in a little bit of trouble here, here and there. So it, it added humor to it. Um, it added, like I said, that, that empathy and it added that emotional connection. Um, and in the end, I don't know if it, if, if the attraction is, 100% better or 50% better, but at least our intention was to give it a, a clear focus and to um, give it more emotional impact. Because one of the things in, in, its, in, in its original form, um, and again, I think it's so important for all these things, if, if it doesn't have that emotional connection, if people don't walk out, like I said earlier, feeling something, then, then you've cheated them in a way. They, they, they put down their hard-earned cash and you didn't entertain them. <laughs> um, I, I, and I do think it definitely does that just because, I mean, I've, I've only seen like uh, POVs of the ride and I also don't understand the language that's being spoken, but I still do feel like you're still very engaged in it and you uh, understand the story that's going along. And that's, that's just, I think, through like just the visual representations of these characters. Like you're saying, you, you can get instantly connected to uh, a tiger just because of how you process that in your own life, um, which is interesting. Right. So um, before, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm really talking your ear off about Tokyo Disney Sea. I just, I'm curious for- a um, great park, it's fantastic. <laughs> um, for Mermaid Lagoon, I'll just quickly touch on that one. Uh, beautiful in its own way, in a different way. Like you said, a lot more, um, it's a lot more animated and focused on the Little Mermaid, of course. Um, and I, it kind of, I, from what I've seen, it looks like you're underwater and it's so immersive in that sort of a sense. So to, to kind of create that feeling and that separation from the rest of the park, how did you kind of do that? And when you enter above and then you go down, like were little things like that thought about how like, I mean, just like that, that motion can tie into the, the subliminal messaging of like going underneath water. I there were, uh, actually there were some practical um, aspects to, you know, the, the choice of putting it in indoors. First off, you know, Tokyo, um, the climate there can be pretty severe. It gets really hot um, and muggy during the summer. They have a pretty severe rainy season and it actually gets cold enough there in the winter time that it snows. Often the snow doesn't stay on the ground, but it snows. So that's a pretty extreme temperature range that you're dealing with. And we knew that this land, it's basically the kiddie land. It's the land for little kids. It was the equivalent to Toontown, you know, cause it has a, it has a little play area in it. It has small go round rides. And so we wanted to make sure on a very practical level that the, our audience, understanding who our audience was, families with little kids, would have a very comfortable environment to enjoy all these attractions and shows and such. Um, so that, that's what kind of drove the, the decision to put it, put it indoors. Second thing, to recreate that world, I remember having conversations with um, Steve Kirk about this. You know, he loved Toontown. He said, but gee, you know what? You still, imagine if you could control everything all everything about that environment you know with toontown you know you're still outdoors you know, there's, there's still real sky in there and um 
I think it works as a cartoon world, but to, I mean, to have complete control over every aspect of the visual experience, how the lighting works, um, how every detail works. When you're doing it indoors, you have that control. You can do it. Um, and then as you mentioned, this idea of entering at a higher elevation, this goes back to one of the principles of that whole park that I mentioned earlier, that it's great that, you know, it was very considered, you know, where, how you present things using ele elevation change. In this case, you came in high, you were actually kind of at water level, right? And then you went down underneath the water into, into the environment of being under the sea. Um, actually, part of that grew too out of um, earlier, before we, before I worked on uh, the Little Mermaid attraction in Tokyo Disney Sea, we were looking at doing a Little Mermaid ride for Paris, and I worked with Tony Baxter on that, and we actually did a mock-up because um, one of the aspects of that ride was going to be the same thing that you were you started above the water. We were going to use a, a suspended ride vehicle, and that then you went down underneath the water. And we did this mock-up where we were playing around with different ways to create a water line using lighting, using prop, you know, props and special effects and things. So, so a lot of that thinking went into what we ended up doing in, uh, in Tokyo with the Little Mermaid there. So just interesting how all these things are <laughs> interconnected. And I mean, that, that was one of the great things about Imagineering uh, that um, there's this collective you know, uh, exchange of ideas too that hap happens there um, and um, cross cross pollination of, of ideas that, you know, often, you know, you came up with something and it might not work for that thing you're working on that day or that particular project, but, you know, you cataloged in the back of your head or something that you heard somebody else talk about. And then maybe two years later, you're working on something, you go, oh yeah, remember when we talked about taking that giant thing and turning it upside down and putting the light on it and doing that? It'll work perfect here Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that actually kind of almost segues perfectly. I was going to combine a couple of questions that um, this idea of, I mean, when I was originally thinking about it, I spoke with uh, Don Carson the other day. He, he mentioned it then and I didn't elaborate, but now I'm thinking about it, how you guys were both working on uh, two different Splash Mountains at the same time. What I wanted to ask was, did you guys ever kind of team up and discuss? And then a larger question in all of that is, you as an like as an imagineer you're working with so many others that have their own um like creative thoughts and processes in the way that they view things that um and that's what what makes all these attractions so great because there's so many different designs that go into things but how, yeah how, how does it work to work with others in imagineering when you all have different ways of being cre creative i guess is kind of the the larger question i have first off don is probably one of my favorite theme park designers then, now, and probably forever. In fact, I'm actually working with Don currently on some, on some stuff. You know, Don and I have maintained our friendship through the years, and uh, joy of my life is to, to work with Don Carson. I mean, in some ways, we have, a, we, have, we have different design approaches. You know, he came from illustration, I came from animation, but uh, we share the same passion for storytelling and for creating great environments and for engaging guests in the experience. And, and Don is just a master, an absolute master. Um, and so even though when we were doing Splash Mountain, the two Splash Mountains had a little different aesthetic. I think the main thing, both with that experience and a lot of the experience, especially at that time at Imagineering, you know, everybody, everybody was kind of, I, I don't want to say it, there was, there was not, it wasn't like a, a competition, but everybody was aware of everyone else's greatness and wanted to be as great or greater. And so it was a very, it was kind of a very healthy, wow, look at what Don did over there with that scene. And, you know, we'd study it and then, and then not to copy it, but to take the essence and the greatness of what he was doing and try to make sure ours lived up to that. And so, um, and so that, that, that's what came out of that collaboration. But then about the, your other comment, just about working with people, to me, that was the joy of Imagineering and, um, and the energy you get working with these incredibly cr smart, creative, passionate people. And, you know, as I moved up the ranks and, um, and that meant doing less and less hands-on drawing and hands-on designing and more about just 
working with the teams and understanding the teams and how to get the most out of teams. And so it kind of, it forced me and taught me about um, embracing and appreciating each individual and what they brought to the, pro the product or, or to the process. And then helping them understand because we're always the last to see ourselves. And I, like I, I mentioned early on, I was fortunate that people like Tony Baxter and Marty Scalar saw things in myself that I didn't see and celebrated that and made me better because of that. So I always remembered that in the back of my head and tried to apply that with the people that I worked with, you know, tried to see the best in them and help them to see the best in themselves and what they were doing, encourage them and also help them understand how what they were doing fit into the bigger picture of what we were trying to accomplish. Like I said earlier on, there's so many moving parts in these, in these pro projects and so many pieces that it's easy to become myopic and to lose sight of the bigger, bigger picture of what they're doing. So, um, and I've used, I've used this, this analogy before. I often thought about myself like a conductor of an orchestra because a conductor <clears throat> has to have a couple things in order to be a great conductor. One, he has to really understand what the score is, how with the music piece that he's going to be conducting. And I always equated that to the story and the big idea of the project. I have, I have to be the one that owns that the most and understands that and all the nuances of it. And then the second thing a conductor does is have this amazing collection of musicians, um, some with various degrees of abilities and talent, but his job is to understand their, who's, who's, where their strengths and their weaknesses are, and then help them under, first help them understand the, 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 the musical score and how what they're doing, no matter how, simp how simple their musical piece might be, like the guy playing the triangle, you know, he's just gonna ding every you know, 16 bars he hits that triangle, but without that, that piece of music wouldn't be the same. And so helping them understand, you know, how their piece fit into the grander whole became my job and became, and it was really, it was really fun. And it was a joy to, you know, to then see people really rise to the occasion. And often they would surprise you because, you know, having come up through the ranks and having actually drawn things and designed things, there, there's a tendency to think that, okay, that's the idea. What I did is the idea. And often I would have in my mind, oh, I want this like Albert the monkey. We had a, a variety of different ideas of how he was going to look. And I did some sketches. Um, we had a few different artists, Chris Runco, Ethan Reed, doing drawings of what the monkey might look like. Some were more realistic, some were more cartoony. Uh, and in the end, what we ended up with was kind of a combination of everything. I think Ethan Reed did the final, final drawing of him. And it was better because it was than any one of us could have done. And I think that's the great thing about Imagineering. When you let the process just flow and you acknowledge how everybody's working into it, the end product is always going to be better than something I could have done by myself. It's, it's interesting how you, um, like the analogy you're using of like being a conductor and being the one who kind of sees what people have to offer um, is, is what you're saying you can do at this point, which is what was done for you. So it's just interesting to see how like that sort of progresses. And I'm sure that the people that you've um, given that opportunity to will grow to do the same thing, um, which is I awesome. Really yeah. <laughs> and so the show is called How to Become an Imagineer. So that's my, that's my end question for everybody is, and it's not, not even just necessarily Imagineering because I think you could take this to um, any sort of like theme, theme park design or uh, really there's so many other like facets of entertainment that you could take it to, but specifically people who are interested in creating like theme park design and these immersive lands and rides and stories. Um, what is your advice for people who want to do that as a career and uh, yeah, just like, ha. How? <laughs> I think I've already mentioned this early on in this, this talk, but to me, it takes, uh, it takes a few things. Um, first is craft, you know, learn your craft. If you, uh, if you draw, if you sculpt, uh, if you design, if you're great with color, uh, if you're a writer, if you're a producer, learn that craft, you know, go to school, take the classes necessary and apply yourself to it and practice, 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 be as great as you can be. Um, 
when we were learning animation, learning to draw, there was this book by um, this, this Russian artist called Nicolades. It's called The Natural Way to Draw. And in there he says, all of us have a thousand bad drawings in us. So he said, start drawing now. And the whole idea was just, you know, that practice, that idea of practicing. So getting back to craft, learn, learn your craft. And then, then be, get, be smart. Study everything else. You know, Rolly, you mentioned Rolly Crump earlier. I remember one, one of the things that Rolly said to me, I got to work with Rolly for a short period there when he came back to Imagineering. He said, Walt always told his Imagineers and his artists, you know, be like a sponge go out into the world and be a student of the world, be interested by everything um, because it just makes you a richer person. And so, so now you got your craft, go out, get some smarts, get some world experience. And then the third thing is have a passion for what you do. Re believe in what you do and um, be open and listen to people. I think that's important, but, um, but, be true to yourself, understand what is that thing about whatever you're doing that excited you and, and made you wake up in the morning and couldn't wait to get to work, you know, bring that passion to what you do. So learn your, learn your craft, go out and be smart. And, and then how do you apply those, that smart and that experience to your craft and then let passion drive it all? Wow, well, um, I, I think that's fantastic advice. <laughs> and um, it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. I feel like it you are so easy to listen to and to watch, and I hope that everyone who is watching is thoroughly enjoying it as much as I did. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to have, I feel like I've, I've learned so much that I didn't know before. And I really appreciate how, um, and you mentioned it before the interview that you were gonna kind of take it from this lens of how to become an Imagineer. And I feel like there, you did reference so much of just the the logical process of how how you did things um, and how that how that's the way you have to think. Um, and I, I really appreciate that you did all of that. So I just, it's a big thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. This has been, been really fun. You're lovely. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so a big thank you to Joe. Joe, if you're watching this, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us today. I have definitely learned so much and learned things that I didn't necessarily pick up on beforehand. And now I'm so glad that I do because it is just continuing to grow this um, like admiration for Imagineers and Imagineering and just people who create and design things like this as a living and the amazing genius minds that you all have because it's very brilliant um, and I am I'm glad to be able to like understand how your how your brain ticks a little bit more and if you enjoyed listening to Joe speak of course you need to give him a nice big like so like the video uh, comment down below what you thought of the interview if there would be any other questions that you would ever want to um, hear Joe talk about or just in general I guess what what you would want to hear Imagineers talk about make sure that you comment them down below and if you like talking Disney. I mean, literally anything Disney. That is exactly what we do here on the channel. So make sure that you subscribe to it. But until next week, folks, I will see you all real soon. Bye, everyone.